Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. A special welcome to any visitors we may have with us. And also to those watching online, we hope that someday you can uh, join us in the sanctuary here. We get to meet you in person. Um, after the, the service this morning, we'll have coffee and tea and fellowship in the fellowship hall and also celebrate the 90th birthday of John Zevenbergen. I read there's even cake this morning, so congratulations, John, on your birthday. And uh, well, also a reminder that we have a service at 5 o'clock this evening, the uh, praise and worship and prayer service, uh, where we'll also be praying for crops and industry. And I believe that is it. <laughs> I will now pass the service over to Pastor Sid. The psalmist says these words in Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never learn those who devour my people as men eat bread and who do not call on the Lord? There they are, overwhelmed with dread, for God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. We are coming off the Easter weekend where we gather together with so many, not only here, but around the world, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to invite you to stand and receive these words of greeting from him. It is he who greets us with these words, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ to the working of his Holy Spirit and all God's children said, amen. amen. Lift up your hearts and sing to the Lord.
Jesus was talking with Pharisees and teachers of the law. Sadducees were together with them. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Allow me to invite you into a word of confession. Lord Jesus, we have watched you love your Father in heaven totally and completely. So much so that you, you followed his direction in your life. You sought him out. You talked with him, prayed with him, you loved him deeply and dearly to the point where you were able to trust him every step of the way, every step through Jerusalem, every step through the Via Della Rosa carrying your cross, every step towards Golgotha, you followed him, Lord Jesus. And then you fulfilled your Father's heart. And you allowed them to crucify you on a cross. And in doing so, we had no idea at the time, but we've come to realize you did that because you loved your neighbor as yourself the two thieves on the cross, the centurion with all of his fellow henchmen down below, the disciples and his band of people who watched and waited in agony and pain, and those who walked by on the road Pharisees and Sadducees alike, for all you died on the cross. Thank you for modeling this command to us in a way that we did not understand. And as we hear that law spoken, we just know how far we fall short in loving God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul and strength. And the same in loving our neighbors, how often we fall short, finding ourselves coveting what others have, finding ourselves saying negative things and bad-mouthing others so that we might feel better ourselves, finding ourselves with so much stuff and I'm unable to see those who have so little. Finding ourselves not being pure and faithful in our relationships that you've blessed us with. Finding ourselves wrestling with family members, with those in authority over us, finding ourselves sometimes detached from our moms and our dads. For that, we ask for forgiveness, Lord Jesus. Forgive us where we have failed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us 
where we have failed to love you. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Thank you for gathering us in worship. The brilliance of the sunshine has placed a longing of spring in our hearts. May we live life to the fullest with you as our center. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that we have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him at the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. May we celebrate with song, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Isaac, you know how it goes here, hey? You know the rhythm and the routine? Yep, very good. Do you know that same rhythm and routine at home? Isaac, are you going to school already? Not yet? Oh, you're going to be on Monday? No, on Tuesday. On Tuesday you're going to school? Wow, neat. Are you going to school already? Yeah, what grade are you in? Grade three? Are you in grade four? Wow, good for you. You know, when you go to school, um, hi, Tony. Tony, are you, what grade are you in? Grade three? You know, when teachers, when teachers start, start school, what grade are you in? Grade two? And you're in grade four? Man, you guys are getting so big. Wow. When your teacher meets you for the very first time, your teacher also has, also has to study and also has to do homework. And what's her most important homework? Do you know what her most important homework is? What's your teacher's most important homework? Your teacher's most important homework is to get to know all your names. That's what she's doing. She's studying before you come to class. I need to know their names. Why does she need to know your name? Yes, Eden. That is so true. If your teacher doesn't know your name, they could get mixed up with somebody else. That's a great answer. Yes. So at school, we, uh, there's somebody with the same name as me, and she always gets mixed up. So you know, like, Isaac, and we're both like, what? I know. What do you happen if you've got two Isaacs in the same room? Boy, that's got to be tricky. <laughs> it keeps you on your toes. What's that? You've got another Isaac in your class? No. Okay. Yes. Here's the, okay. Here's the real reason why it's so important for your teachers to know your name. Because when they call your name and look at you, they unlock your heart and your mind. And they have your attention. And so when I say, hmm, Ethan, when was your birthday? Yesterday. Yesterday. Ethan, happy birthday. Congratulations. Can you carry the candle for me? And so here's what happens. Before I leave, before you leave, what happens is your mom and dad know you best because they're the ones that gave you your name. And when they call out your name, you give them your attention most of the time. And they give you their love. And it's the same with Jesus. Jesus knows each one of your names. I'm going to have a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for each one of the children before us this morning. And I thank you for the names that you've given them. More than that, Lord, I thank you for knowing their names. And I pray that they may hear you calling their names. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and let's Give a blessing to the people, to the congregation. One, two, three. The Lord be with you and also with you. All right, Ethan, you lead them out. Lord Jesus, we thank you for each of their names. We thank you for knowing uh, each of us intimately by our names. And so we pray that as we turn to your word again, that, that you may show yourself in ways that we could not have imagined and that we may sense the fullness of your love, the fullness of your presence 
and your care in our midst. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm reading from John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Beginning with verse 10. So the resurrection happened in John 20. The crucifixion happened in John 19. We're now picking it up at verse 10. John chapter 20 verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and, and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the foot and the other at the head. They asked her, woman, Why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and, and, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking she was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So far the reading of God's word. We now enter the liturgical time of Eastertide seven weeks before Pentecost, 49 days. His disciples and followers were still coming to grips with the gore and the anguish and the guilt and the grief of his crucifixion. Then they ran into the reality of Jesus having been raised from the dead. According to John's gospel, Mary Magdalene ran to tell Peter and John what she had discovered, and all three of them came running back to the tomb, confronted with the same reality. The stone had been rolled back, no body in sight, burial clothes folded up, and strips of linen and headcloth still in the tomb. And this is how John picks up the story. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. It made me ask, why did Peter and John go back home? What's striking about Mary is she stayed alone at the tomb and wept. This is the same Mary Magdalene who hung around and witnessed the crucifixion. She waited. 
and waited and saw them take down his body off the cross. She watched them wrap him up in burial cloths and she followed them to where he was buried. There she was. The first to arrive at the tomb in the early dawn of that first day of the week, only to discover the tomb was empty. His body gone, but the grave clothes still there. And she ran off to get the two disciples to tell them, come running and confirm her discovery. Then the two disciples went home. And Mary stayed by herself, alone, allowing her grief to catch up with her where she wept in the pain of her loss. Some of you know that pain when everyone else seems to have gone home and you remain and you finally weep and wail alone in your loss. You have grieved and wept and leaked more tears than what you knew you had tears stretching into hours, hours into days, sometimes months. Sometimes years. And what's unique about our God is how he meets us in our grief. He knows our sorrow, feels our pain. He even counts our tears. Psalm 56, verse 8. You record my lament, list my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus opens with these words, his second blessing, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In his opening words, Paul's second letter to the church of Corinth, he finished writing his first letter, 1 Corinthians 15, explaining the resurrection of the dead, trying to help people understand what takes place when you place your faith in the risen Lord, that you too will be raised from the dead. And he begins his second letter with these words, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the suffering of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our suffering overflows. The author of the Heidelberg Catechism, the two pastors who who wrote out the Heidelberg Catechism, knew their God as one who knew what it was to comfort. As the whole catechism begins, what is your only comfort in life and in death? This afternoon at 2.30, Many of the St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church community will be gathering in Eastridge School for a memorial service for one of their own. 
for Meredith Weeb, a 16-year-old girl who went missing and was found underneath Jubilee Bridge, drowned in the Sydenham River. Grief can strike us hard and leave us numb. But often it is in the waiting of our emptiness, in the silence of our grief, where God meets us, where Jesus shows up, where the Holy Spirit comforts in the waiting. Two angels in the tomb asked Mary, woman, why are you crying? And I've always such that, found that such an odd question for the angels to be asking. Who asks to someone who is grieving freshly, whose life is still in shock, especially in the shadows of the weekend's crucifixion, it was still less than 48 hours since many witnessed the barbaric execution of a man who graced and touched so many lives. If you want to anger or insult a person who just lost a loved one, ask them, why are you crying? Mary bent over and looked into the tomb and noticed two angels were sitting where Jesus' body had been one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she told them, They have taken away my Lord. She said, I don't know where they have put him. She was looking for his body to prepare some spices and help bring closure to her new reality. And at this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Then Jesus asks her the same question. The same question as the angels. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Now the question begins to unsettle, to agitate, to upset and scratch a little deeper. Who are you looking for? John opens his gospel with a similar question. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist has his disciples and he sees Jesus and he points to Jesus and says, look, the Lamb of the world who has come to take away the sins of the world. And the two disciples said, wow, John the Baptist is pointing to him. And so these two disciples go and they follow Jesus. And then Jesus asks this question. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? What a strange question for Jesus to ask. What do you want? Why are you following me? Because we know Jesus saying, reaching out, saying, come and follow me. But here he says to two disciples, what do you want? And the question rings out throughout the entire book of John. What do you want? How many of us are able to answer that question? What do you want? Because many of us don't really know what we want and at the same time always find ourselves searching, looking for the next thing, looking for the next person, the next excitement. It's the same with who are you looking for? We're often looking for the next Gretzky, for the next Taylor Swift, for the next Caitlin Carter, for the next Zach Eddy? Who is going to be our next prime minister? Or who is going to be the next president? Who are you looking for? The Apostle John closes his gospel 
asking Mary Magdalene twice, who are you looking for? Thinking she was the gardener, he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Mary was still looking for his punctured, blood-stained, torn, dead body of her Lord. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary knew that voice and the way he called her name. Mary Magdalene saw her risen Lord and Savior standing in front of him. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni. Her heart quickly shifted from sorrow into surprise, from grief into gratitude, in the same way that Jesus knew Mary. Jesus also knows each one of us. Scripture reminds us that God knows us better than we know ourselves. O oh Lord, you have searched me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Already at so many of our baptisms as infants, the Lord Jesus has called out our names and in so many different ways. God has revealed the reality of the risen Christ at work in our hearts, in and through the gifts of his Holy Spirit. Jesus revealed himself when he called out to her. He was alive and he had a message for Mary to give to his brothers. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Instead of telling Mary to go back to the disciples, Jesus embraces them with the closest of relationships calling them my brothers, having bestowed forgiveness on his disciples to receive this great news of his own resurrection and their adoption into God's family. And their invitation into Christ's kingdom as servants and apostles. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And Mary knew each of them by name. And if the truth were to be told, most of us were first introduced to the resurrection of Jesus by people who knew the risen Lord and called us by our name to introduce us to his presence in our lives. I think of a barber that I had. He was also our youth elder and I went to him every month. And he would talk to me and he would ask questions. Sid, how's your personal relationship with Jesus? He brought it in a language that was relatable and understand to where I was at at that time and invited me to consider what's holding me back 
to inviting Jesus into my heart. Jesus was alive and is alive. He has risen from the dead and he loves me too. When I go to Belleville, I look forward to seeing Henry Verberg. My mom and dad were very open with their faith and thus discipled us well, but it, I believe it was Henry who got to know me in a personal and relatable way that let my guard down and asked if I'd met the risen Lord. Who is your Mary Magdalene? Who is the one who helped you invite Jesus into your heart and be Lord of your life? And it may well have been your parents. It may well have been a youth elder. It may have been a good friend. Maybe it was your spouse who helped you, your husband, or your wife. And maybe your mom and dad told you their story, or a friend at camp invited you to consider, or a teacher at the Christian school, or maybe it was a grandparent what an amazing thing that Jesus has done, given this most powerful gift to share with others the reality of Christ's resurrection, waiting to enter our hearts and transform our lives. On June 23rd, I plan to give people who have heard Jesus reveal himself as their risen Lord and Savior in their lives. On June 23rd, I'd like to give people who, who want to make public profession of faith, that's, that's the way we do it in our church, among our people. If you are a young person and you're thinking, what's my next step in growth? What, where can I grow in my walk with the Lord? public profession of faith is how we not only celebrate what Jesus has done in your life and who you are, but we also acknowledge that you now understand what it means to belong to the body of Christ. It's the step that we as a church of Jesus Christ invite those who've been baptized as infants to claim promises given to them in their baptism. And maybe you have not been baptized and are growing in your relationship with Jesus and have already invited him to be the Lord of your life and you'd like to share that with others. You too would like to belong to the larger church. Listen to how the Apostle Paul begins his book of Ephesians. He has a prayer in there in Ephesians chapter 1. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Included in the many benefits of placing your faith in Jesus is finding yourself connected to a much larger body of Christ. The same happened with Mary. Rather than living together around the life and death of their master, teacher and Lord, they now discovered he was alive. They witnessed the master's life, 
teachings, miracles, death, and resurrection back to life. And it was his love for each of them that glued their lives together, infusing new life into their fellowship, giving further meaning and purpose to their existence. Now they would all be commissioned by Jesus to go and tell others. Go into all nations, baptizing him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And this is my promise. This is my covenant. I will be with you always. Which is how we are able to testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this afternoon at East Ridge High School, a faith community will gather with many others to grieve with a mom and a dad Grandparents whose daughter and granddaughter has been taken away from them. But they are not a people without hope. Most of them are people whose lives have already been transformed through the resurrection of Jesus, who called each of them by name, allowing their grief to be shared in gratitude for the shortened life of their daughter, granddaughter, Meredith Weeb. And how many of us have not stood around a grave about to be filled with the remains of a loved one, about to be lowered with the assurance and the hope that our resurrected Lord gave us that our loved ones who knew him will also be raised from the dead and that there will be a new heaven and a new earth where God will continue to dwell in the midst and the center of his people. Whose name have you called to tell them about our risen Lord. And who was the one who called your name, who knew you, and invited you to open your heart to the fullness of his love, his mercy, and his grace? May the Lord continue to work among us. May his body continue to thrive and to grow as each of the children will hear their names called in the weeks and the months and the years and the decades to come. And all God's children said, Amen. Holy Spirit, we want to thank you for meeting us in our center, in the core of our being, and inviting us to walk with you. We pray that you may continue to work in and through your body, your church. We pray for those who have received your baptism, even as infants, that they too may open their hearts to claim the covenant promises that you have given so that they too may be able to testify and witness to the risen Lord at work in their lives. Thank you for the tremendous strength that you give us to walk through difficult times and the hope that you've planted deep within each of our hearts of your presence, of your reality, and your return. Thank you for the freedom which you've placed within our souls, knowing that you are our God, that you are our Father, and that we are your children. 
your people and that we belong to you. So may we continue to worship you, adore you, and walk with you not only this day, but this week to come. And may you continue to reveal yourself in ways to us that we had never discovered before and fill our hearts with the joy and the creativity of your kingdom. Thank you for the gift that you've given us in the fullness of a father's love, in the fullness of Christ's love, in the fullness of the working of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's second offering is for missionary support. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us all to gather in your presence to worship and praise you. We pray for missionaries all around the world as they have devoted their life to spread your word. We pray for the relationship with God, physical and emotional well-being, finances and stamina in stressful conditions. We pray that they will rely on the Lord for ministry success and depend on him for prayer. We especially remember the missionaries, Winnebel Ritter, Steve and Anna Jessel, that our church supports. We pray for their safety and their needs be met. Thank you for blessing our church budget and ministry shares. Help us to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Kristen, thank you for your offering this morning as well. Let's come to our God and our congregational prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for gathering us in worship. What a mystery it is that you gather not just us, but some 25 faith communities within this town. And then throughout this entire province, hundreds and thousands of bodies of Christ. And then all across this nation and in every other nation, Lord, and you raise up children. Lord, we thank you for each of our children, Lord. We thank you for Samuel. We thank you for Sutton and Lucy. We thank you for Camila, Sierra, Xander, for Caden. We thank you for Eden, Lord. We thank you for Peter and Sophia and Phoebe. We thank you for Curtis and Michael and Claire and Landon. Lord, we thank you for Aiden and Tony. We thank you for Theo and Henry and Emma. We thank you for Grace. We thank you for Isabel and Isaac and Levi. We thank you for Henry. Or for, we thank you for Ian, um, for Ethan and for Reed and Logan and Lord. Not only do you know each of these children, but you know the ones that I have overlooked. You know the infants, the toddlers. You know the children that are growing within wombs. All of this is too wonderful for us to comprehend. Thank you, Father God, for knowing each of us intimately. We thank you for our young people, Lord. We thank you for working in and through each of their hearts. We thank you for Timothy Christian School, for the staff and the teachers, but also for our high schools in town. Lord, may you continue to work in and through their administrators, their teachers. Lord, we pray that you may work in the hearts of our young people in a way that they catch your presence and open their hearts to your fullness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Lord, we pray that you may continue to be with those among us who grieve. We thank you that Greg and Marlene were able to care for and help care for Greg's sister, Kim. And that on that Easter weekend, you took her to be with you. On that Easter Sunday, Lord, you took her to be with you. And again, the peace that you fill in our hearts, in the assurance that you've given us in your resurrection, we give you thanks. Lord, we pray for the Weeb family as they gather together and share their grief with this entire community. Lord, we pray for students Meredith's friends, as they gather, trying to come to grips with all of this, and may they too have Mary Magdalene's around them sharing the good news of your resurrection. Bless Pastor Ed and Pastor Ted, and bless, bless Jill as she too participates and gives prayer. We are so grateful for our single members of this congregation for the love and the life which they continue to bring to this congregation. We are thankful, Lord, for the families that you have grown in this fertile part of the world. We are thankful for the marriages that you have blessed and even where there were hardships and even when there were difficult times and when there were struggles, Lord, in waiting in the suffering and the difficulties, you show yourself ever present. You bring healing, you bring hope, you bring renewal, you bring new life. Lord, for that we give you thanks. We celebrate with John and Wendy today in their anniversary. Lord, we celebrate with John Zavenbergen the words that come to his mouth 
repeatedly reflect on the blessings that you have given him in his life, how you have watched over him. Yesterday was his 90th birthday and there were just simply too many people to give the time that he wanted to give in celebrating this wonderful day. And I like the way, Lord, in which you stretch birthdays longer than a day over into a week, sometimes into a month of celebration. May that be John's case as well. Bless he and Jenny, Lord, and thank you for all of our seniors. May you continue to watch over them and bless them. We pray for Dirk DeVries as he goes in for knee surgery this week. May you bless the work of the surgeons, Lord, and may go well for him so that he may indeed recover in this time of spring where he so loves to be outdoors. Lord, may you give him patience. Lord, may you walk with him and his wife as well as they go through this surgery together. Father God, we want to thank you for um, working through the hearts of so many people. And our cry is for the people of Gaza and the people of Israel. Lord, there are whispers and rumors of breakthroughs in peace. We pray you may continue to work for the brokers, Lord, for those who are negotiating we pray for those who are hostages. We pray for those who are hungry, Lord. May your kingdom come in that part of the world. We pray the same for Ukraine as they continue to receive bombs after bombs and the difficulty of withstanding all of that. Lord, we pray, we pray for peace. And then tomorrow we're reminded again of just how constant you are even though there may well be a cloud cover, Lord, we know that behind that cloud cover, there's this amazing event taking place in a full, total eclipse. And yet you yawn because this continues day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. We may see the moon in the sky wax and wane, but the moon is always there. We may see your sun in daytime and not at night, but the sun is always there. In the same way, Lord God, you are always here. You are always in our midst, and you will never leave us nor forsake us, and for that we give you thanks. So we continue to lift up our hearts to you. We continue to give you the honor and the glory and the praise. We pray that not only May you bless us, Father God, but in our living, in everything we do and say, that we may bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and receive the Lord's parting benediction. Lift up your hearts and receive these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.